Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I think I'm going to begin because I don't want to be the last thing between you and your first drink of the evening. Uh, right? So we have uh, till 6 o'clock. Um, please stop me at any time that uh, I'm speaking quickly because I tend to speak quite quickly. So uh, my name is Barbara Toronto. I'm the Digital Program Director at the New York Public Library. Uh, there are many people at the library who have uh, the title, uh, their title includes digital. Um, when we have a chat during the uh, break, I can tell you about all of them. So, this is a very famous picture from the library, and I know Mr. Walker is in the audience. Um, it's actually in uh, above Astor Hall. It's a description, it's actually a drawing of the way the stacks exist below the building at 42nd Street. And you can see the eight stories of stacks that are actually holding up the Beaux-Arts building that is 100 years old this year. Uh, a very interesting uh, philosophical position to be in, um, to have the books holding the building together. So from physical uh, to virtual via 2.1 million handcrafted item level metadata records. Um, and you will note on the bottom that the rate of creation accelerated for demonstration purposes. So in fact, um, making metadata records uh, looks like it happens this quickly, but of course doesn't happen this quickly. All these metadata records, 2.1 million, um, were done in, in part to imagine several large-scale projects. Uh, the first of this was the uh, digital gallery, which is right here in front of you, with 800,000 uh, images available to the public. Uh, in Motion, the African-American Migration Experience, the National Digital Newspaper Program, and the uh, Digital Object Preservation Access Repository. Uh, all of these things together were uh, drivers for creating metadata records professionally. During the six-year project uh, that I mentioned earlier called uh, Digital Gallery, it was then known as Visual Treasures, the library employed 47 subject specialists to work on descriptive metadata. And to the left, I'm sure you can't read their names, but they're up on the website. Uh, each one of them a professional, many of them with multiple degrees, um, as you can imagine. Uh, we call um, their activity OCD, and if anyone heard me speak about this <laughs> at DLF, it stands for uh, Obsessive Compulsive Descriptors. Um, people who have never ever put enough subject tracings on anything. Um, uh, I think that possibly rare book catalogers sort of are the premier uh, case for that. Uh, one of the collections, uh, first collections described uh, uh, was the Miss Frankie Butthoff American Menus Collection, 1851 to 1939. Uh, and American here refers to the collector, not to the menus, because the menus are from uh, many places, many of them American, but many of them German, from ship lines coming from Europe. And on the left, you can see there's a little uh, collection up on the web and digital gallery about them. This is a view of the collection, the physical collection, as it's housed in its new home, the Rare Books Division. It's uh, many, many, many linear feet. Uh, it used to be in the General Research Division and used to be available for people to come in and request and actually sit down, open the boxes, and go through all the menus uh, manually, anyone who could make an appointment. Uh, once they were digitized, the collection was removed from public service and rehoused and transferred uh, to a monitored environment and now lives in uh, Long Island City. Um, that's, that's not degraded, that's, that was, that's going up. <laughs> um, the physical collection was used a lot. There were a lot of in very interesting stories. On the right, you'll see Catch the Day Seafood Trends. One of the most interesting things out of the physical collection, one story we heard was that folks uh, um, 
a fish population fellow, I guess a, an a evolutionary biologist, was interested in the numbers of dishes and references to fish in the menus at the turn of the century so he could determine the fish populations around Long Island. Very interesting application to look in menus. Um, uh, so it's sort of no end of what you can imagine a researcher would be interested in. The menu data began life as a list created by volunteers, and the volunteers at the library can be any age, but generally tend to be people who do not need to work for a living, um, who sat at a desk uh, in the reading room and uh, literally handcrafted, typed at first, um, descriptions uh, according to a protocol that was given to them by the librarians. Uh, eventually, the list was migrated to a spreadsheet and then to Fox Pro database and then to the FileMaker database and then to the act to, then to an access database and finally to Hades which was uh, our then metadata authoring tool. Uh, the data was munged and concatenated and scrubbed. Uh, there was a lot of strange um, features in the data. Uh, normalized, extracted, indexed, and ended up in digital gallery looking like this. And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, and on the bottom you can see there's actually a metadata record uh, with some data in there, a profession, not professionally created, professionally cleaned up. Lovely to look at and chocked full of human readable information, uh, yet for all our best intentions and the thousands of hours of work of metadata creation, uh, our users were frustrated and we were very frustrated. Um, kinds of questions we get, how come I can't search on the items in the menus? How come the personalities and place names are not in the index? Uh, where are these places? Where is the, where is the Astor Hotel? Uh, why can't I do a deep dive into the data? Can I have all the Roosevelt related items? All things you can imagine someone would be interested in, but we had no way to give them because in fact what we had were images. Okay. Um, the need was apparent, uh, and the will was there, but the money was gone. Uh, in 2007, faced with cutbacks and baseline figures regarding the true cost of metadata creation, about $1,000 a line, uh, we took a deep step backward and looked at the program and uh, changing the landscape of social media. And what you're looking at is a picture of my son a few years ago on two telephones and two computers and watching TV and playing the game. Among other things, uh, we had an issue of uh, scale. Not enough staff and possibly impossible to ever have enough staff to do the work we wanted to do. So um, a uh, rather senior manager at the library said, so why not just OCR it? And if you look uh, very clearly right in front of your face, it's pretty clear why you can't OCR it. It's either handwritten or uh, the fonts are so irregular as even when it's typed that no OCR engine was going to pick up anything greater than maybe the maximum, maximum accuracy rate we would get would be 75%, which is pretty high unless you're a user and then 75% is a failure. Uh, so we needed to de deconstruct the digital workflow if we were going to manage the volume of new work that was required. And we changed tactics. Uh, since we had passionate and engaged users, uh, we thought, why not use them? Um, have a digital barn raising or canning club. Um, so our first pitiful engagement in what we might call crowdsourcing today was Barb puts $25 into the Amazon's Mechanical Turk and offers people the opportunity to transcribe menus for a buck a hit. What I didn't realize is that I'd have to keep feeding, fe uh, feeding the piggy bank. Not only feeding the piggy bank, I was feeding with my own money and uh, a dollar a piece of work was a very high rate. I think for the Mechanical Turk, I think they paid one cent, a tenth of a cent, anyway. that. That was, uh, that was 2007, so that was the first attempt at, at, uh, at crowdsourcing uh, data. 
We were saved from our own folly uh, by the library deciding to write two grants, one to the National Endowment for Humanities and one to the Institute of Museum and Library Services to create an application that would in fact capture the imagination of the, of the uh, public and get them to participate in metadata creation. The resulting application is called What's on the Menu? It's at menus.nypl.org. Uh, very simple um, excuse me, URL. Uh, you can see it's a decent and uh, interesting um, interface. The menus themselves sometimes are not exactly beautiful objects because there are multiples and duplicates um, or what look like duplicates until you start to transcribe them and you realize that there are 365 menus from um, uh, an ocean liner, and each morning the, uh, a new menu is written. So they look identical, but only on examination can you see that they're actually different, um, different content. So this is what the interface looks like. Uh, we went through the process of creating JPEG 2000s for all of the menu data because it was impossible to read the um, text at the, at the quality of uh, derivative we were providing. And you can see here, uh, you can blow it up and see something quite closely. Uh, we created a, a structured um, form so that we could, well, we created a form so that data would go in in a structured manner, wasn't free text, everything had to be parsed ahead of time. We knew that we couldn't possibly just do a transcription because a transcription would be a string of text and we wouldn't ever be able to parse it back out. So in fact, a whole data structure was created for capturing this data, um, including, I don't know if you can see the fields very clearly on that, how much it costs, et cetera. Uh, there is a um, dashboard that allows you to see what's going on. There's also something else very interesting. We knew immediately that folks would be interested in exporting the data and being able to use it for their own purposes. So uh, we built a, a service to allow people to download the data as it was created, either to download data and add to it and upload it back up or to actually just download the data set and uh, do work on it separately. Um, we also created heat maps so people could see exactly what had been transcribed so that you didn't have to come back and say, well, I don't know who's done it or how many people have done it. Um, this has a, um, a, an uh, unforeseen consequence and I'll talk about that in a little bit. This lets you see uh, exactly how many things have been transcribed and how many things are on the list to be transcribed. And then there's a variety of, uh, of, of folks who are referencing it and it shows up quite frequently in Google Images. Uh, what's on the menu has some interesting other aspects. It has been connected to things in book readers. There's deep linking to the data. Uh, on, on the site, um, which is, uh, also presents a, an issue as we go forward. As you can see, this the graphs of who's doing what and under what circumstances are making reference to things. So the question is, how do you engage the public in creating uh, metadata? Um, it's a very interesting question. The top frame on the, on the very top, you will see a blog um, entry by a woman by the name of Rebecca Fetterman. We were very lucky at the library to have a curator who is herself um, uh, a culinary uh, star. And because she was already a star and had a large following, she was able to engage her population and her community in the project. Once her community was involved in the project, it took off uh, like wildfire. Um, and you will see on the bottom that we did our own marketing by talking about our own projects in the blogs that are currently on the, on the website. So this social experiment, because it really is a social experiment, much more than it is a metadata experiment, um, questions, can you harness the energy of the crowd? Uh, well, yes, you can, um, but how do you keep them engaged? 
So one of the things that's built into the site are gaming techniques. There are set, there's small rewards for transcribing numbers of, of uh, menus. You can keep track of your score. You can keep track of the number of things that you do. You can have whole groups of people who uh, can compete on the site to transcribe uh, data. Um, uh, there has been an attempt to create flash events where people say, let's go to a bar on Bleecker Street and sit down and spend an hour and see how many menus we can transcribe in an hour. And actually, believe, believe it or not, people show up. Um, and then there's, there's compulsions. There are people actually who are uh, addicted to doing this. Um, they actually really like it. So the OCD that I mentioned earlier is not restricted to catalogers. It's clearly part of uh, uh, other people's um, mental makeup. Has it been successful? Uh, well, yes, it's been very successful. As you can see, as of Monday, December 12, 2011, there have been 659,032 dishes transcribed from 11,000 1112 well, menus, which is kind of remarkable, um, seeing it's only been up for less than a year. Um, on the right hand side, you can see what amounts to a tag cloud, which to me is kind of useless, seeing as there's so many different dishes and they don't repeat that often, except Blue Point Oysters, which seems to be on the menu in every restaurant in 1901. Um, uh, I don't know how good of a navigation tool it is, but there's certainly a lot of dishes. So it raises a lot of serious issues for libraries. Um, I mentioned earlier the heat maps. What was meant as an indicator to users that in fact work had been done, um, detracted or, or I don't know, inhibited, I don't know if that's the right word, um, didn't prevent, but it encouraged people not to go back and transcribe a menu that had already been transcribed. Um, and therefore, we have single transcriptions for menus, which is a feat, but is very unscientific. And we have no way to prove that the transcription is at all accurate. So the second thing that's very interesting here is what's the public's appetite for doing this? And I guess the pun is intended. Um, it was very successful. It got a lot of press. Question is, can you maintain that kind of activity? Can everybody in this room decide to go out and do a crowdsourcing project of such a size and get that kind of response? And I don't have an answer for you, and I'm not sure how long um, we can entertain people long enough to get them to participate in these activities. So I think another way of putting this is, are these projects sustainable as a, meta, as a model for metadata creation? Um, I think they may be sustainable as part of a solution, as something that you could do rarely. I don't see that it's possible to do this on a, a large scale all the time and replace um, professional catalogers. Uh, not only that, these things would be undiscoverable without the professional catalogers in the first place. Uh, the point I raised earlier is how rigorous is the data that we are collecting. Um, it seemed to me if we were going to do this again, we would want to poll the community and create three transcriptions for every menu and then do some computational work on which and on polling and voting on which ones are accurate. Um, there's nothing currently that prevents you from putting anything in those fields. Um, which is, of course, becomes another problem for a professional metadata person to come back and clean it up and review it. So did we just create ourselves a bigger problem? A uh, question that arises is what measures are we going to use to ensure the quality? Uh, as I just mentioned, possibly triangulating and having three copies. But um, what really amounts to quality in this case? Uh, and do we care about rigor? And if we do, what kind of rigor? And if we don't care about rigor, why not? So there's uh, a lot of discussion about collecting, getting the public to work on creating metadata. Not a lot of discussion about what that means, what we would get, uh, how we would control it. 
what kind of standards we'd apply to it, if we did apply any standards, and um, how would we enforce those standards. Um, on the other hand, if we raise the barrier too high, then we're not going to get any participation. Some other issues that have come up is how do these new activities fit into the life cycle of digital content at the library? Um, the library for the longest time has talked about digital content as the reformatting, either the reforming and formatting of its analog content and keeping that as the permanent digital collection and or accepting born digital collections. We're not sure where in fact things like transcription fit into the schema of preservation metadata or not preservation metadata. Is it disposable? Uh, what's its disposition? Who owns it? Who's a curator of transcriptions of content? Um, is this part of the bibliographic record? Um, is it a mezzanine data store to facilitate discovery? I'm, I don't have any answers. I'm just talking about the issues that we've faced. So we've come to a Joycean moment um, when interests collide, but they collide in a very uh, special space. So on one hand, we have controlled vocabulary, standards, authorized lists, discoverability, quality, and management. On the other side, we have tagging, personal, local, meaningful, aggregated, decontextualized, serendipitous, and fun. And I, don't, I didn't accidentally pick the Grim Reaper. Um, and I don't know who the other guy is. I guess he's a ninja or something. Um, I, I can't quite tell. Um, but uh, I'm going to come back to that. So recently in Harper's, there was a very interesting article by Andy Merrifield from an essay called uh, Crowd Politics. And he says, Nobody can know in advance when an epic historical geographic performance will be enacted, nor are there preconceived formulas for what makes a successful encounter. What takes hold is what Joyce and Finnegan's Wake termed a kaleidoscape. In what forms will the Joycean everybody begin to express itself as, is as it is challenges the crisis-ridden, and I put in librarian order? because I believe, in fact, we are challenging the librarian order with these activities. So as much as I adore the right column, I find myself inclined to the left column, um, because it is part of my job at the library to ensure the long-term preservation of our digital assets. And if it's part of my job at the library, I don't know what to do with this stuff. We face a huge preservation challenge, even if we make the decision to acquire and preserve the data set that has emerged from this initiative. Uh, we're a long way from having established policies and best practices regarding such activities and or outcomes. These are not new concerns, but the issues are now bearing down on us in a very practical and real way. Our collections development department has talked uh, on many occasions about the future when we'll have knowledge products created from our collections. But collections development hasn't even imagined that the future is now. It is sitting on my doorstep uh, with a request to move it into the repository. So I just want to end with uh, the true life story of waking up on a Sunday night and waking up on a Sunday night. I must have been sleeping all afternoon. Um, getting email on a Sunday night. I guess I wake up to my email on Sunday night. Um, and having requests for the ingestion of no less than five digital humanities projects, the data outcome from five digital humanities projects, with uh, very little understanding or even discussion at the library, on the library side, about what that would mean in terms of digital preservation, what it would mean in terms of the record, the historical record and the social record, and whether in fact this becomes part of our collection. These are all policies that haven't been um, investigated and haven't been explored and are ideas that really need to be fleshed out. So um, there is 
data out there, and there's more and more data out there, but the question is, what part of this data belongs in the library? What part of it belongs in the digital preservation repository? Uh, what part of it is disposable? And fundamentally, who makes those decisions, um, and how do we implement them? That's it. Thank you. Oops, I moved it. Any questions? Yes. So how do you compare this with the New York Times recapture project? Yeah. It seems, seems sort of similar. Yeah, it's sort of similar, except the New York Times will come to the New York Public Library and give us their archive and say, keep it. So it's not, it's not a creation of the data. It's what do you do with it and where does it go? So yes, um, lots of people are creating data. Um, the problem for the library isn't that we can't get people to create data, and as wonderful as it is, and as wonderful as a discovery tool as it is, the question is where does this fit in our preservation strategy? What happens when the New York Times does come and dumps on us or leaves for to the library, in fact, this project? Um, in that case, it might even be clearer because it's their collection. But in the case of ours, is this our collection? This is an issue that needs to be addressed. Yep. Do you have a current disclaimer legal language on the website? People type in their transcript. Yeah. 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 Higher for zero. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's a there's a little disclaimer on the front of it saying that you agreed to do this and we can use it. Um, that's that that's that legal description describes or covers the activity of typing in the transcription. Um, at the library, uh, well, I'm sure, I don't, at least certainly at New York Public, uh, we're very uh, strict and very clear uh, acquisition and deaccessioning policy. So once you take something into the library and claim it's part of the collections, it isn't so easy to get out again. And then there becomes an obligation to do something about it and to preserve it. So my issues are really around that whole problem set. When does it become part of our collection? What part of our collection? How is it related to our collection? And does it, how do we even begin to plan or make policies about what we do for, with it in the future? Um, Right now, it's a fabulously fun project, but Digital Humanities presents to us a very different set of issues. I mean, they might be the same issues, but there seems to be some understanding that the outcome of scientific work will pro pro uh, pro um, produce data sets that are part and parcel of the work. I don't know that that is actually, we've come to that point in the, in the humanities yet, I and mean, we've not done the planning for it. Yes? So, I mean, this is essentially metadata about objects in your collection. Um, why can't you treat it just as an wouldn't EAD object? Well, that's another set of data we don't have <laughs> a clear policy on. Yes, absolutely, we could. Uh, we could, except that there is a drive by part of certain um, communities in the library that actually want us to treat it not like that, but to treat it like part of the collection. So the issue isn't really about what I would prefer to do or what I could do with it. It's a question about what the library or collections development wants to do with it. Do they consider it part of their collection? Will they take it in as their collection? What does that mean? Not, not just as a navigation tool. Right. Yes, as a navigation tool, we can throw it away, right? I, mean, I, I would think you would have more of an issue if what you had was a set of scholarly annotations uh, on the menus, although maybe that would be simpler because that would clearly be part of the collection. I don't know. Right. I... If what you have is transcriptions, that feels to be much more like metadata. It, do, it feels like that to me as well, but uh, the issues have come, been ris have risen that it is in fact more than that. It is in fact a data set in its own right. and. So, and we should be acquired uh, into the repository. So, yes, very, very, I have all sorts of solutions. I have all sorts of technical solutions. I don't have many policy solutions. 
Anyone else? Is the FYPL website archived itself? I mean, could it fit under the same policy that you know, FYPL generally does? It's sort of a digital archiving. It's not archiving websites. We do not archive websites. No. Mm -mm. No, uh, it has something to do with, it has a lot to do with the concept, to the, the conceiving of what the digital preservation repository is for and what the permanent collection is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A lot of the research on distributed tagings suggests that a very small portion of actually do it consistently and they account for, you know, 10% account for 90% right. of the work that's been done. Um, I'm wondering whether do people register in order to be able to do this kind of thing? Yes. Work? And what do you know about the people who are doing this? The distribution of effort, for example. Uh, yeah, we've got compulsive activity. We have folks, we have a small group of very dedicated, very interesting, and then we've got people who've done it once and go away, never come back again. Yes, absolutely. So um, I would imagine it's the same with Wikipedia, people who are monitoring articles all the time, constantly updating them. Um, that's their job, right? Um, in this case, we have collided with, you know, the world of foodies, which of course has its own following and that's very advantageous for this kind of a site. I don't know if we were transcribing, well currently we're, we're digitizing the um, uh, Tilden papers and I don't think that we'll probably get the rise out of the community to transcribe the Tilden papers. Um, you know, miles and miles and miles of correspondence. But you're right, absolutely. We have a small core who are, are clearly dedicated. Um, but they might go on to the next thing, right? Wait till they hit the next thing. And I think that's part of my, my concern about how sustainable these crowdsourcing projects are. Yes? It's not necessarily a requirement, your desire for <clears throat> multiple reviews at first. Uh, maybe the thing to do is to, as part of your gaming, is to challenge certain foodies, like the, uh, the oyster lovers, to validate the oysters on, as presented on the menu, in other words, the different groups. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that would be a very good idea. I think in the same way that Wikipedia does it, where there are experts on the biochemistry abstracts, whatever, someone actually reviews it to make sure that it's reasonably accurate or it doesn't have anything that's egregious. Um, we can certainly computationally find out, find the bad words or the stuff pe the kids have put in or somebody's put in. Um, but I think that's a very good idea. There is a, um, uh, they are doing version two. They're trying to put in more gaming technology to uh, continue engagement, but also to, um, I think they realized that when they started looking at the data as it came in, that there were tremendous issues with how they were ever going to monitor it and how they were ever going to clean it up. Yep, I'm sorry. To follow on, um, uh, a while back, uh, the Denver Public Library uh, had a clean room and was very scientific and very technical in uh, reproducing and scanning the Edward Curtis uh, glass plates here. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, 25 miles up the road in Boulder, in a carnaging building, by the way, the community came in and scanned and tagged the uh, whatever photographs, whatever documents, been uh, submitted to the library. So in other words, it was more of a crowdsource. So in one case, you had volume, and whereas in the other case, you had high quality. And I think maybe that's something to be considered in a case like this, is perhaps if people knew that some menus were 
of a higher quality or a higher value scholastically than others, you could maybe approach the two groups and then, again, competition and Right, I, th I, think you, I think you raised some really interesting points that you could go, there are many steps forward from this in order to improve the, the uh, transcription, to improve the activity and the quality. Um, I'll pass that on. Anyone else? Thank you. Oh, sorry, yep. yep. Um, do you have any evidence that doing this has increased or changed the use of the collection? Um, no, <laughs> I don't, I, um, I have read many articles about it, I have read many reviews about it, but I have no evidence that actually has changed the use of the collection. I do know that when they were first published in the digital gallery as images, they're the only, there was a large surge of people actually recreating the menus, actually cooking and serving the menus. Possibly that's happening again, but I have no evidence of that's the case. No, I, I don't. That would be interesting. I'd yep. also just be curious about the, um, what sort of trends in traffic in terms of uh, how people are looking at each of the menu. Another way that you could think about this is it's a public engagement thing. It seems like um, whether or not you have Yeah. Um, is it, is it numbers of people viewing the well, the numbers of people viewing the objects is low, but the time spent is high because you have to transcribe it. But, but I think maybe one of the things the library should do is publish statistics on it. It would be very good to know how many people. So, yes, the statistics that there's so many, so many dishes were created is, is interesting, but it's interesting more as a social experiment to find out how many people were actually engaged, how many people spent time, what is all the things that you're asking about. And I'm sure that we could publish that. And that would be very much more, yeah, what are the trends here and how do we work with those trends to make it go forward? Okay. Thank you.